if you don't meet a child's needs, the damage begins so quickly. And they only have a couple of needs. They need to be safe, connected, loved, significant, that's it. But if you don't meet those needs, they go through the world of the belief that I'll never get those needs met because I'm not worth it. They feel insecure. They feel unworthy. And the saddest thing is, it never goes away. Look at people like Marilyn Monroe, Britney Spears, Michael Jackson, George Michael, Heath Ledger. You see so many people who've got everything except the one thing, which is a sense of self-worth. They don't have that. And people always think that fame damages people. It's actually the opposite. Damaged people want to be famous because then they think they'll be loved. Mm. So it isn't that fame damages you, but if you're damaged, you're attracted to fame. It's like, then I'll get love. And then when you get it, you think, oh, why do you love me with all my problems? Or mm. you don't really love me. You love this image you see on the screen. So in many ways, it actually makes it worse. Marissa Peer, and it's such an honor to have you here. You're a world-renowned therapist and also a world-renowned hypnotherapist. And I'm curious because when I think of something like hypnotherapy, I think for a lot of people, we think of like a guy at a carnival dangling a watch and saying like, look into my eyes. So I thought we'd start off with what is hypnotherapy? Just like at the basics and, and why does it work? So you have a subconscious mind and a conscious mind. And the conscious mind is the analytical mind, but the subconscious is the feeling mind, and the subconscious runs the show. You don't have access to the subconscious. And all of our memories, all of our issues, all of our problems are stored in the subconscious mind. It's like a, like a whole filing system, if you like. But in hypnosis, you can go straight into the subconscious and say, let's go back to why you have a fear of flying, fear of dogs, fear of cats, fear of bees fear of success. And just like you said to Google, hey Google, tell me that, and it comes up. It's the same as typing out to Google, what's the name of something? So the subconscious immediately gives you that information. And it's a way of having perfect access to what makes you tick. Because I've always been a great believer that understanding is power. You can't fix what you don't understand. So I don't know why I drink. I don't know why I can't do it. I don't know why I sabotage myself. I have no idea why I procrastinate. But the mind knows. It knows why you did it, when you learned to do it, why, even why you do it. And when you have access to that information, it changes your entire life. So when you do the work of getting someone into hypnosis, yeah. it shuts off, what is it, the prefrontal cortex? or like Does it shut off all our defenses? It? No, it's, hypnosis doesn't send you to sleep. It actually wakes you up to your incredible oh, potential. That's good. So I was thinking, you know, if you imagine the subconscious mind as a Ferrari, and the conscious is an inexperienced Ferrari driver. There's nothing to do with this Ferrari. They're very, they don't understand it. Or say the subconscious is the most incredible wild stallion, but the conscious is the driver. But the stallion's going to win unless you're experienced enough to know how to handle a Ferrari or a horse. If your mind's like, subconscious mind like this amazing piece of machinery, but unless you understand how to operate it, it just doesn't work for you. So the conscious can't operate the subconscious because the subconscious runs the show. So one is feeling, one is logic. In a battle between logic and emotion, logic never wins. Feeling always wins. Most of us don't really understand that, do we? No. So we always say there's a battle. Here's logic, here's emotion, which was going to win. Well, we know emotions going to win. It wouldn't be wars. We wouldn't fight over, like people are having fights over toilet rolls in a store. I mean, <laughs> is that logical? No, it's emotional. We operate from an emotion. We operate from feelings. And so a good therapist will not want to talk about why, blah, blah. They want to go, let's discover the feeling that made you do this or act like this or feel like that. And when you can do that, it changes everything. So what happens in hypnosis is everything kind of shuts down. The conscious just goes, all the chitter chatter goes away. You go directly into the subconscious and you get access to information that you can't get out of hypnosis. I mean, go to therapy for 10 years and keep talking about why you do what you do, but in hypnosis you get that in, in five minutes. Often in my sessions I began and within 10 minutes I already know exactly what's going on with my client. So you get access to amazing information that you, it's very hard to get out of hypnosis. So that's the magic. So three things are going on. First of all, we're investigating a good, good detective what happened here? Why do you do that? What was, where did you learn that? And then we begin to negotiate, look, it made sense. They didn't need to do that ever again. And then in the same time, we're, we're now now becoming a code as we've gone from an 
investigator to an inter interrupter to a coder who starts to code in a different belief. Of course you can do this. You're meant to do this. Doing this is easy. So it's the three things happening all together. Many people say I've been in therapy for years to find out why I do what I do, but I still do it. I know why I drink, still drink. So with my clients, I might go back and find out why they're always sick, and then I'm going to remove them. Then I'm going to give them a mantra like, your body is a wellness-making machine. It does wellness, only wellness, always wellness. And they take, they listen to them, they take their way, and they go, oh, I'm going to keep saying that. My body is a wellness-making machine. I have a phenomenal dependable, reliable memory, whatever it is they haven't got, we're also giving them the opposite. I have an outstanding memory. I'm super fit. I'm super, I'm magnetically lovable. So we give them a particular message because we know about the what thing about the mind is it loves powerful, exciting words that make a picture. I'm okay. I mean, that doesn't mean make a picture. Yeah. I'm not bad. That's a silly thing because the mind doesn't hear a negative. You might as well say I'm bad. So, the, the final part is to rewire the client, give them a, a mantra. I prefer to call it a statement of truth, an affirmation, if you like, something that they say and say. I often give them a song to listen to on their phone, but they might slightly change the lyrics. But it's really just giving them a different perspective on who they are and why they're here. And the magical thing is that in hypnosis, the critical factor is shut down completely. Mm -hmm. So when you say my body is a wellness making machine, it doesn't go, don't be ridiculous. It yeah. goes, yeah, bring it on because the critical factor has gone away. And now the mind is sending a different message to the body. My body is a wellness making, my immune system is phenomenal. My metabolic rate is perfect. It doesn't go, come on, who are you trying to kid? The critical factor shut down. These suggestions become real. The mind is now sending a very different suggestion to the body. But also the suggestions of the body to the mind are different. Oh, I'm not nervous. I'm excited. I'm not stressed out of my mind. I'm just a little bit dehydrated. I'm not exhausted, but I do need to get some sleep. So it's the, it's the three ways that are going on in the session and the three things that are happening with the mind starting to send different messages backwards and forwards that the subconscious and conscious mind now totally are on board with and believe. When people are repeating these statements, do they listen to like an affirmation on repeat or a song on repeat? How do you have them? So I make all my clients a recording, all of my 16,000 people I've trained. We make people a transformational recording. It's about 15 minutes long. They listen to it every day because one of the rules of the mind is the mind learns by repetition. Another rule of the mind is that you act in a way that totally lines up with how you identify yourself. When you change the, how you identify yourself, everything changes. Another one is that every thought you think is not a thought, it's a blueprint that your mind, body, and psyche work all the time to make real. So you give the client a bit of education. This is not a word, this is a blueprint. This is, you're learning it by repetition. The mind loves words that are powerful and exciting. You're supposed to turn your mind on so that the recording does it, but they also have something else. They might have a song on their ring ringtone. Maybe that's a song from The Lion King, Love is All Around, or mm -hmm. Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Something that's very important to them. It might be, I can see clearly now. It might be, um, I'm having the time of my life, but we find, oh, this girl is on fire. Or it might be the one from Frozen, Let It Go, Let It Go, and you just hold on to the old stuff anyway. So they have a recording, they have something on their ringtone that they like, and they have a little mantra statement they put on their fridge, Maybe they're going to write it on their hand. One of my clients said, I printed it on my pillows. It's the first and the last thing I see. I wrote on my pillows, I'm enough. So we're, we're saturating them with these powerful messages. And of course, here's another rule of the mind. You can't focus. You can't be in two lanes. If you're saying I'm enough, I'm amazing, I'm great. I'm, you can't be saying I'm also an idiot. I got rocks for brains and I'm butterfingers. It's not, you can't drive in two lanes. You've got to get into one lane. The mind cannot hold conflicting beliefs. It can't say, I'm smart, I'm stupid, I'm gorgeous, I'm ugly, I'm great, I'm an idiot. It can't do that. So if you keep your mind on, it's a bit like when you're skiing, if you keep your mind on where you want to go, you can't go where you don't want to go. Yeah. When you're driving on the freeway, you can't go where you don't want to go if you're keeping your mind on where you're going. So pick a lane, stay in it, and understand the mind cannot hold conflicting thoughts. And if you pick good thoughts, while you're busy in the good thoughts, you can't possibly think the bad ones. Makes sense. You talk about tapping into the purpose, not the behavior. Yeah. And I really love that. I'm curious, what do you mean by that? 
So I, I created my own therapy called RTT, Rapid Transformational Therapy. We have something called role function purpose. And so we put someone in hypnosis and say, okay, Kevin, you're always late, prolifically late, can never be on time. I want you to go in and find the part of you that's always late. Tap your, and, I want you to, and they go, I'm the part of Kevin that's always late. And you know what? He gets a lot of attention being late. People look at him when he's late. They go, oh, wow, I never realized that. And so you're finding that, you see, when people say, you know, I just can't give up drinking. I'm unable to resist cake. I've got diabetes. I know I shouldn't. Or I got heart problems. I know I shouldn't be eating all this fatty food, but I just can't stop it. There's a big clue there. I just can't stop. And they just can't stop. It's actually saying, a part of me wants to do this. And actually, mm -hmm. like people say, um, I sabotage every relationship. I only like married men. I only like people who are not available. And if they like me, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. What on earth is going on? Well, we know something's going on because that's yeah. not normal behavior. It's certainly not logical behavior. I like you if you don't like me. <laughs> and I'm going to run after you. But the minute you like me, I don't want you anymore. Well, that's weird, isn't it? But if you go into the subconscious, say, but, but I have a great fear of being rejected. And if I pick someone who isn't available, they can't reject me. Somebody married can never reject me. It's not available to me. So to make it easy, everything that we're looking for is to do three things. It's to punish you, to protect you, or to prioritize you. So if you only like people who are not available, I mean, I've met women who say, I, I like people in jail. Why? Is, well, they can never leave me. Mm. Well, that makes sense, actually. They're never going to cheat on you. They probably are with other people. I like people who are married. Why is that? I can never really let myself go with them because they're not mine anyway. Mm. So that's a protection. I can't be hurt if I find someone who's not ever going to be mine anyway. Punishing is when I was a kid, I stole money from my mum's purse. Now I've got these terrible headaches. Mm -hmm. My mind's become a judge to a jail and prioritize is like a lot of attention. And so whatever issue people have, pretty much anything from headaches to addictions to fears to phobias, they all come under the umbrella of this is to punish you, protect you, or prioritize you. Then it gets easier. Well, it's got to be one of those three things. And you can, and then it just makes it easier because it's always one of those three things. It's so beautiful that you can put it into these categories because yeah. it makes it much more simple. Yeah. And I think about unavailability and, you know, a large focus of the conversations I have are about relationships yeah. and just generally human connection and the repeating patterns mm. that occur. And when I was in my mid 20s after really devastating couple betrayals in a row, mm -hmm. I exclusively dated incredibly unavailable people of course. and i loved one night stands i yeah. loved short because you were safe right yeah. and it was when i finally just had this it, it, it this recognition that mm. i was running from of people course. who could love me because i was afraid you. they'd leave because they had the power to hurt you and you know from the minute we're born we have a driving force and that driving force is i must Find connection and avoid rejection because that's how you survive. But you have a little baby. You know that when they're born, they grip very tight. They're hardwired to connect and avoid rejection. So when you leave the room, they cry. If they're not sure you're there, they cry. But that never really goes away. They need to find connection and avoid rejection. And when you are rejected, because it wasn't that long ago that rejection would kill you. If you were banished or cast out from the tribe or marooned or isolated, you would die. And even though we know now it doesn't kill us, it still feels like it just might. Listen to all those songs, I'd die if you leave me. I can't live without you. I'm nothing. You're the only person in the whole world for me. None of that is even remotely true. But it feels so true that it might as well be true. Do you think because we are this biological, uh, kind of automated animal, mm -hmm. that we are even prepared for the level of technology and things that we have to we are inundated with today you know i it's a challenge because human beings are wired for connection more than anything else we understood primitively that safety is a number if i belong to a big tribe a big crowd you know, if you watch game of thrones you think oh if you're in a big crowd you're going to be safe if you're out on your own wandering the moors you'll probably get killed so we are wired for connection but technology is very disconnecting you know everyone's on their phones you see people in a restaurant all on their phones we now have driverless cars there's no tellers in the bank there's no stores i actually turned up at an airport recently in germany there wasn't a single member of staff it was all robotic and i actually had a broken leg and i was trying to get a buggy and it's like but there was nobody and that was just a weird thing i've never had that before no 
staff. It was all machines and robots and I didn't really like that too much, you know. It's quite nice to have that human touch and I wonder what we're doing to the next generation, which we are, they're so disconnected. You know, you see babies now on iPads, babies that know how to swipe right and, and, you know, they want to be on the phone. I was actually at Soho House and sent this little baby and we were going, look at that little girl and she was tiny and she was swiping and pressing and she knew exactly how to operate a mobile phone. She couldn't have been more than 10 months old but and she was fascinated by it. But to learn that and, of course, all the strollers now face outwards, they used to face inwards and we are actually disconnecting an entire generation. And we already know what's happening because... That, like in Japan, you can rent a robot to keep you company. And in Japan, they've got the highest rate of women of 50 going to jail thinking, saying, I don't want to come out. I love it in here. It's like being in a girls' boarding school. And they want to go back because they're so connected in an institution and disconnected on their own. In their regular life, they're feeling yeah. that. Well, speaking of that level of disconnection, a large pillar of your work is about these experiences that we have mm. in childhood that affect us and really give us that challenge of feeling unworthy. Mm. What are some things that can create that for a child, some common ones? Well, for instance, boys that don't have fathers are much more likely to join a gang, much more likely to get into trouble. And there's a whole generation now of fatherless children, fatherless boys, because, you know, the same sex parent is very important. And so when you're disconnected as a child, when you don't have connection, two things happen. The first is you believe you're not worthy of it. You don't think, oh, I'm, I need to find it. You don't think, oh, I haven't got that missing thing. You think, oh, I don't deserve that missing thing. You see, when you stop loving a child or appear to not love a child, you may love it deeply, but if the child doesn't know it, feel it, hear it, they don't stop loving you. They immediately stop loving themselves. A child can't say, Hey, my knees aren't met here. Oh, my mother's mentally ill. Hey, my knees met. Oh, my dad's an alcoholic child. I can only go, hey, my knees aren't met because I'm not worthy of having them met. You see, before the age of five, children don't even have any logic. They only have feeling. There is no logic. That's why you can say, I'm going to kiss the pain, but there's a monster under the bed. They don't logic anything away. And so the damage begins so quickly if you don't meet a child's needs. And they only have a couple of needs. They need to be safe, connected, loved, significant. That's it. But if you don't meet those needs, they go through the world of the belief that I'll never get those needs met because I'm not worth it all. They decide, well, I'm going to have to find someone to meet all those needs because I can't meet them myself. And, and that's not true. And so it, it disempowers children greatly. So when they don't get their basic needs met, they feel insecure. They feel unworthy. And the saddest thing is, it never goes away. You can see someone of 50 who still look at people like Marilyn Monroe, Britney Spears, Michael Jackson, George Michael, Heath Ledger. You see so many people who've got everything except the one thing, which is a sense of self-worth. They don't have that. And people always think that fame damages, but it's actually the opposite. Damaged people want to be famous because then they think they'll be loved. Mm. So it isn't that fame damages you, but if you're damaged, you're attracted to fame. It's like, then I'll get love. And then when you get it, you think, oh, why do you love me with all my problems? Or you don't really love me. You love this image you see on the screen. So in many ways, it actually makes it worse. So your pursuit of feeling significant and enough yeah. leads you to want to be famous. And then you get the love you were seeking, but yeah. you realize it's not. So you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's yeah. not actually the love you were seeking. Yeah. That's why Whitney Houston called a movie, Can I Be Me? Because she had to be what she thought people loved in her, and that wasn't her at all. She had to play the only part she'd ever known, which was a good girl. And that really wasn't her at all. And so, you know, you have to go right back and realize that a parent's job is not to teach your kid Mandarin or give them organic broccoli. A parent's job is to raise kids with high self-esteem. And a school's mm -hmm. job is the same. It's not about grades. It's can you give these kids high self-esteem so they can cope in the world? And... Most schools and parents are so busy trying to give you organic food or make you good or make you smart when the only thing that really matters is if you've got high self-esteem. If you haven't heard me talk about Cozy Earth Sheets before, 
let me tell you, I'm about to introduce you to the greatest sheets you will ever have touch your body. Anytime someone comes to our house and stays in our guest room, they always want to know what is the bed situation. What are the sheets that we have? Their sheets, their comforters, their duvets, everything is magic. Their bedding is naturally breathable. It's temperature regulating. It's so damn soft. It's ethically sourced viscose from bamboo. It's incredible. And the brand was featured on Oprah's favorite things, but before that, it was featured on Mark's favorite things. Like, I discovered this brand years ago before I ever even chatted with them about being a sponsor for the podcast. And because I love their product so much, I asked for an exclusive offer for you and you get 40% off site-wide. And now they have pajamas. They have like loungewear. So not only do you get to wrap yourself in the experience of the sheets as clothing, but you then get to get into the bed in that. So you're like double wrapped. And so all you got to do to save 40% off site-wide is use the code GROVES at checkout. So just my last name, G-R-O-V-E-S. So go to CozyEarth.com. C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H dot com and use the code Groves and you get 40% off all their products. When we think of the manifestation of low self-worth, I think we often think of highly traumatized children, mm. children of alcoholics, abuse, things like that. What are some other subtle ways, maybe like a seemingly good childhood can actually create low self-worth? You see, if you say to your kid, I love you so much because you're so beautiful, or I love you so much because you're so smart, what they hear is, oh, and if I wasn't, you wouldn't. So when you say to her, I love you because you're smart, I'm so proud you're a grade A student, that kid now feels, oh, that's what I got to be my whole life to belong. And they become workaholics, overachievers. And I worked with a school in San Francisco. We had 15 suicides in a year because of these kids whose parents expect them to be everything you've got to be now. And you've mm-hmm. got to be like me. You've got to be big in IT. I've worked with many children of high achievers who are suicidal because their parents expect so much of them. They love them, they put them in private school, they get them extra lessons, extra tuition, but they feel you expect so much and and they can't do it. And they often become anorexic or bulimic or have all kinds of issues, fears and phobias. I worked with one kid who never left his room because he couldn't cope with what his father expected of him because of course we don't give birth to ourselves. So the other problems are really expecting so much of it, expecting them to be like you, Mm -hmm. and they're nothing like you, expecting them to be as good as you, or or telling them that you love them because, Mm. making it conditional, not unconditional. That sounds to me like these are adults who seem trapped in a developmental, like young state. Mm. How do we go through this maturation process? Like, how do I go from recognizing, you know, my parents celebrated me for getting high grades or this belief comes from this aspect of childhood. How do I bridge from that to all of a sudden letting go of a behavior? Well, you know, first of all, you have to understand that you only, we come through our parents, not from them. We're totally different. You know, I'm very tidy. My daughter's very messy, but you know, she's not me. I didn't give birth to myself. How boring would that be? She's (laughs) nothing like me. Well, she is in some ways. But I have to celebrate. I don't have to say, look, I'm tidy. You've got to be tidy. I do that. I'm a vegan. You've got to be a vegan or vice versa. You have to let your kids do their own thing. You know, I have a friend who's a vegan. The minute their kid turned 18, they went out and bought McDonald's. I have other friends whose kid, who, who were so laid back, their kids became very different to them because they've got to have something to rebel against. You've got to let your kids mm. be totally different to you. They don't want to be like you. But the biggest thing is loving your kids for themselves, saying, I love you no matter what you do. I'll support you no matter what you do. One of my friends was telling me that her daughter went into weightlifting. She went, oh, my God, your arms. She goes, Mom, I like them like that. She went, okay. I never mentioned it again because she had big arms. And she was like, what have you done? She said, I like it like that. I like lifting weights. It makes me feel good. And the mother went, okay, that's your choice. But a lot of people say, no, that's wrong. We don't do that in our family. So... You got to break this belief that they are your kids to be molded into you. They're not. They're people with their own likes. Nothing like you. You, know, you might be a vegan with a meat eating kid, or vice versa. But you got to see them as individuals. They're really only yours for a very fleeting amount of time. They start. You start off as a parent, being everything. You're their friend, their confidant, their cook, their cleaner, their nurse. And later, the only thing you can ever hope to be is their friend. You want to have a great friendship with your kids, which you can't have if you don't let them be themselves. Yes, I was, you know, like Paul Newman's son shot himself. I mean, he couldn't cope with being Paul Newman's son because he could never be Paul Newman. And that's that's the high expectation. 
well, Disney's kid killed themselves, um, but Bacharach's daughter killed herself. I mean, suicide from high school is very common from high expecting parents. We discussed some of the ways that we can create that low self-worth in a child through mm. a parenting style. What are some of the ways that we can actually ensure or try to ensure as best as possible a healthy development of a child for to have high self-worth? Well, you know, you can only be good at what you love. It's impossible to be good at what you hate. So if your kid has an interest that you don't have, don't poo-poo it. You know, see, this makes you happy. I love watching you learn. And you need to praise them a lot. You know, I saw how good you were with your sister. You're so good with animals. You're so funny. You're so interesting. Because many kids think, I'm not. I've got nothing to offer the world. So say the kind of obvious, you're so interesting to talk to. I love your company. I really enjoy being around you. You know, you're really good at debating. You're so good with animals. Give them a sense of worth. You know, we all want to feel worth it. And it's not over-praising them, just praising them specific. You know, if you just say, you're great, you're great, you're great, you have to say, I notice how good you are with a dog. I notice how good you are with your little I notice how good you are with grandpa. You're really good at talking to him. So you've got to be specific praise, intermittent, not constant. So the child begins to think, oh, yeah, this is my gift. I really am good at that. Because praise makes children grow and criticism withers them. But they have to believe that you mean it, not that, oh, that's just mom. She's, of course she's going to say that. We talk about the importance of parenting mm -hmm. and that aspect of the child's development. Can we experience this low self-worth wound from outside of our family system? Oh, yes. You could have amazing parents. That doesn't stop kids saying, I was molested by the babysitter. Mm -hmm. I was molested by the boy next door. I was molested by my cousin. I was bullied. So my teacher said I was rubbish. My teacher said I wasn't smart. And many kids have an awful time at school. And often they don't want to tell their parents. Sometimes parents say, you know, my mom was so lovely, but she had three kids. And I couldn't tell her what was going on. I didn't want to hurt her anymore. So even with the best parenting in the world, who has not access to your kids? And what are they doing to them? I mean, it it's terrifying when you think of some of the things that kids are exposed to. Like my little girl, when they wanted to watch Cinderella, she, she spelled it with an S-I-N. Some porn thing came up on the television. She went, Mommy, is that Cinderella? I'm like, no, that's not Cinderella. <laughs> and I didn't even know you could do that. Um, so you, they get exposed to so much that they don't understand. Or if you're watching the television, you're watching a war going on. To them, that's in their house. So oh. they can't watch horror movies, scary stuff. You shouldn't be talking about 9-11 in front of them. Sometimes you have to, but you got to try and protect them from stuff they're not able to understand. So that that can be a challenge. Or when they hear that you hate dad or you hate mom or that that's very hard for them because they don't have logic to understand that this is a scary movie on television. Not a scary so life. So you, you got to kind of cocoon them and protect them, but also teach them how to parent themselves. And as a parent, your job is to give your kids two things, confidence and independence. In fact, it took me a long time to realize that my job was to make my kid as independent as fast as I could. Because, of course, you like them to be dependent and keep them yeah. around even when they're 30. But you've got to teach them also how to parent yourself. What do you need to hear every day? I need to hear I'm loved. Well, why don't you say that everybody loves me, I'm a lovable kid? What do you, I need to feel I matter. So how about saying I'm smart? You know, I have them. Um, and I'm enough program in schools, and I have um, we have three different programs in schools, and it's amazing. And they're all about having kids say every day, "I matter, I'm significant, I'm enough, I got a gift to share with the world, and I'm lovable." And every school that does this says it's amazing. What's happened is bullying has disappeared, self-esteem has gone up, and these kids are more academic because they have high self-esteem. Yeah. So that you got to, before you start teaching them Latin and French and math, you got to teach them to say, "I matter." I'm lovable, I'm significant, I've got something to offer the world, and I'm enough. And then they're able to learn better because they have that inner peace, the feeling, yeah, I have got something to offer the world. I'm curious, when I was younger, I had the experience of, you know, grade five, grade six, I got a bit, of ch a bit chubby. And then that's also the time that social hierarchy is being created, yeah. you know, from grade five to eight, sure. 10 to 14. And I found the social hierarchy being created and me staying <laughs> yeah. at the lower part. And then I was associating when I finally got fit, I all of a sudden moved up the social hierarchy. Mm. But I was the same essence. And so that was hard for me to reconcile or to make mm. sense of. And what I've found is that I would then battle with this experience of, 
putting on weight or mm. using sugar to yeah. soothe that feeling sure. of not feeling like I fit in. And I'm curious for people who have it, maybe are listening to us and hearing and thinking, oh man, I have a self-worth thing. I have a mm. thing that I want to resolve. How do you go from that experience of what you believe about yourself now and then doing as you're saying, sharing this affirmation about yourself, but it actually feeling like a lie? But it doesn't register a lie. You know, that's not important. Your mind's job is to make your thoughts. But if you think a sad thought, your eyes will fill up with tears. If you think an embarrassing thought, you might start to blush. If you think a sexual thought, you might get really turned on. And if you think about eating, your stomach will rumble. So we know that every day, every minute, your mind is making your thoughts real. The placebo, if what you think about a drug has more of an effect than what's actually in it. The thing you think about a drug will affect you more than the drug. So we already know my mind makes my thoughts real. My body makes my thoughts real. So the trick is to listen to your thoughts. If I say I'm a loser, everything I touch falls apart, I'm not good with people, your mind is going to make that real because that's its job. So you might as well, I mean, I called my last book, Tell Yourself a Better Lie. Because if you're going to say, I'm an idiot, I got rocks for brains, I can't, I, everything I touch falls apart. Well, clearly that isn't true. So why not say I'm the opposite? I'm smart, I'm gifted, I'm lucky, I've got a great memory. It's like saying, uh, if I look at food, I get fat. Well, yeah. That's not true. Huh. I've got the worst immune system in the whole world. Why not just flip it and say, I've got a phenomenal immune system. I've got a phenomenal metabolic system. I've got an enviable memory. Is it a lie? It really doesn't matter. Your mind's going to make it real, whatever you tell it. And I'm a great believer that you should lie, cheat, and steal to your mind every single day. Lie to your mind, cheat, fear, and steal back the phenomenal confidence that you were born with. Why wouldn't you want to do yeah. that? Does it matter if it's a lie? It's like saying, I could eat a horse. Well, Obviously, that's dead. nobody's eating a horse, and you couldn't even eat an eighth of a horse, so that's a lie. I'm starving. This commute is killing me. I'm dying. And these are all I'm dying under my. These are all lies. So we lie to ourselves anyway. So hey, just tell yourself a better lie. Don't even change anything. You're already lying to yourself every day, but just have a better lie. So when you say this commute will be the death of me, this four or five is going to kill me. My boss is the boss from hell. If it was so, you know, it's hotter than hell in Palm Springs right now. Well, that's a lie. But you could say, <laughs> but I'm dealing with it. I'm just got a fan, and in another two weeks, it won't be like this. So you're already lying to yourself. So when you say, isn't that a lie? Yeah, but you've been doing it for years. So you might as well make it easy on yourself and pick a better lie. When we think about ways that we cope with low self worth as, mm -hmm. as adults, we think of things like alcohol, drugs, things like that. But what are some more subtle ways that we do this? Always being late. When you're late and you walk into the city, everyone turns around and looks at you. If you're late, everyone turns around and looks at you. So being late gets you a lot of attention, which you don't want, but you've told you when I want attention. Mm. Being sick. Being sick for a kid is the next best thing to being loved because you get so much mm. attention, but make a fuss of you. Being a people pleaser, being a yes person, always trying to be, be caring. It was amazing. I read a study that said up to 90% of nurses come from dysfunctional families. They give the one thing they haven't got. You know, if you don't think you belong in the world, there's only four things you can do. Imagine you're born and you've got busy parents. Nice parents, but they're always out there in Silicon Valley working. Or maybe you've got parents who don't care. It doesn't matter which, what, whether you've got absent parents, uninterested parents, or busy parents. My parents expect a lot. If a child isn't certain they're loved just for themselves, they've got four choices. The first choice is to be sick. That's so effective for a kid to get asthma, eczema, gluten intolerance, headaches. All of a sudden, they're going to different doctors and specialists. Mum's making gluten-free food, and they've got diffuser. And they think, oh, okay, you don't love me, but I've just proved to myself you worrying about me. So I must mm. mean something to you. That's so effective that many kids never, ever, ever give that up. They're the adults still going to hospital, having tests. Everyone's so worried about them, and they talk about their health all the time because it's the next best thing to being loved. The second thing is to be brilliant, to be outstanding at something. Imagine a tribe, if you were the best hunter, you could spear a buffalo. If you could put up a dwelling quicker, you are now indispensable. So the kids who are achievers think, oh, you love me, but you're telling everyone, my son is a great, my son is on the team, my daughter's a cheerleader, my, and so now they think, mm, 
I do matter. I don't think you love me, but I am significant in this family. The third way which all therapists fall into is the carer. Okay, I haven't got, my needs aren't met, but I'm going to give what I'm missing. I'm going to be kind and good and clean the house and look after other kids and make dinner and lend people money and drive people everywhere because I'm giving the thing I haven't got. And the fourth way, which you tend to do in the other three have taken, is to be the rebel, the kid who bangs on the high shit with their spoon and is still doing that 30 years later because they, the only power they have is to take the power off the adults. But all of those behaviors happen. I call it foreplay, the four roles you play in order to belong. And you don't really have a say in this because the need to belong is so powerful, mm -hmm. so profound and so persistent. If you can't get love for being yourself, then you get love for being sick or an achiever or a carer or the really difficult kid whose parents still love them no matter what. How do I begin to move from one of those roles to being a regular functioning? Yeah. Well, I love this saying, you play the only part you've ever known until that part becomes your own, which means you learn what you live, that you play the only part you've ever known, and yeah. all of a sudden, this is who you are. And the first thing is to think, okay, you know, I was a kid, and my parents were busy, I was always sick. But I'm not that kid. I don't even live with these parents. I don't need that anymore. So it's, you know, when I was a kid, I was always late. I lived so near to the bus stop that took me to school. And I missed the bus at least twice a week. And I'd have to walk home like that. And my father would be so angry. And he wouldn't speak, but he'd get out of the car and he'd drive me to my school. And I never missed the bus coming home. I always missed the bus going. As an adult, I realized, oh, of course, I wanted his attention so desperately I would do anything. Kids can't think, hey, what's a good way? They just think, I'm going to fling myself on the floor in the store and have a tantrum. And then I'm going to get your attention. I'm going to fail at school. I'm going to get sick. We, we just need attention. We don't think I need positivity. It was just any attention will do. So then I understood it and thought, well, I don't need to do that anymore. As an adult, I know my dad loves me. He's immensely proud of me. I didn't know that when I was a kid, but I know it now. And so I don't need it. So it's looking at the issue and thinking, but that isn't me. I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to be scared of people not liking me, not put on the heating because my parents were obsessed with it, buy reduced stuff because that's what they did. So it's a question of, you know, understanding and then saying, but that's not me anymore. And it, it's actually incredibly simple. I did that for that reason. Don't need to do it anymore. It seems too simple almost. Mm. Like, is that the trick yeah it should be simple we've got this belief that therapy is long and hard and arduous and painful no it can be so simple go back and have a look at something go you know i worked with a client who was morbidly obese and his kids had said daddy when you come to get us from this party you mustn't get out of the car if everyone knows how fat you are you mustn't let them see you stay in the car we'll come out they were only about nine and eleven and they didn't come out so he got out of the car and they both started crying, went, Daddy, everyone's seen how fat you are now. We're going to get bullied at school now. You should have stayed in the car because you're so fat. And he said, do you think that? I went straight to Ben and Jerry's and bought four pints of ice cream and a pizza. And I sat in the car and I ate all of it. And I couldn't stop eating, even though my daughters are now going to get bullied because of my eating problem. So this is an emotion that you cannot fix with logic. But when he, I hypnotized, he went back to being a tiny baby, a premature baby, his mother was told, if he doesn't gain weight, he's going to die. You've got to feed him and weigh him every day. Feed, weigh, feed, weigh. And, and it wasn't just that. The mother, if he was vomited, would start crying and screaming. And they had monitors in the cart and videos in the crib. And every time he brought up the food, the mother would panic. And the dad would try and he's got to eat more. He's got to eat more. And, you know, this isn't just a right. This is an imprint. It's imprinting mm -hmm. into a tiny baby. What is going on here? Oh, got to eat more. And then when he began to eat more, the mother would go, oh, he's such a good feeder, you know, he's such a, he's looking like a little t Mac, Mac truck, he's such a good boy. So as the time baby picked up an interesting message, if I don't eat, I will die. When I do eat, everybody loves me. And even though this had happened long ago, when he was a premature baby, and I recently went to a friend's house with premature twins, and I saw that, the monitors, the cameras, the constant feeding and weighing, but they managed to do it very calmly. His mother was hysterical because she thought her baby would die. So all these years later, he's still got the same imprint. When you have a scared child and an authority figure, it's like imagine a 
cat jumps up your mouth, so that cat's going to scratch you and get septicemia. It's an imprint. It's not a fleeting thought. It becomes a fixed mm -hmm. belief. I'll die if I don't eat. And even though he logically knew he'd die if he carried on eating, of course he would. The logic didn't help him. The emotion of seeing that little baby and understanding where it came from not only helped him, it totally freed him. It was all stopped that day because he could say, oh, now it makes sense. Any kid would have done that. I don't have to do it anymore. So logic doesn't fix you. Without the emotion does. Without hypnosis, how would you access that? I don't know. I right. don't know how you would. Yeah, so you might be spinning your wheels your whole life. Yeah, I see people all the time. As I've been I've been in therapy for twenty years. I've been under my doctor for ten years and I how did you do that in twenty minutes? Well, because the mind knows. You know, it's like if you're terrified of thunder or terrified of birds or terrified of dogs. I mean, no, a baby will put its hand straight in a dog's mouth. Yeah. They'll pick up a cockroach and eat it. <laughs> so they don't have these fears. We have to have acquired them. And if you acquired them, you can get rid of them. Your work, RTT, is built on so many. It includes yeah. so many different aspects of intervention. One of the ones uh, that I wanted to ask you about was neuroplasticity. Yeah. Can you explain what neuroplasticity is for the people listening? Yeah, so plastic means to mold. And we talk about plastic surgeon, but actually the word means, it's a Greek word that means to mold. And neuroplasticity means that as you think different thoughts, your mind starts to rewire itself. That if you could look in someone's mind as they think certain thoughts, you'll see that the mind changes. So when you change your thoughts, you're changing everything. Thoughts are things. Every thought you think has a physical reaction and an emotional response. If you think of something terrifying, you can actually feel terror, even mm -hmm. though you're completely safe. If you think of, if you imagine, you know, I was working with a client who couldn't go in the MRI scanner. He said, because I feel like it's a coffin. And when I go mm -hmm. in there, I think, oh my God, I'm already dying. I've got cancer. And, and now this is a premonition. It's going to be what it's like when I'm dead. I'm like, but that's a silly thought because you're not dying. People don't always die of cancer. Many people thrive and get better. And it's not a coffin. People say, oh, look at that plane. I'm hurting in a, in a metal tube. And so it's our thoughts create neuroplasticity. If you think a thought, I'm going to die on this plane. I'm dying in this scanning machine. This lift is giving me a panic attack. I'm claustrophobic. Then it will become real. And so you have to flip that around. Don't you lie in bed every night in that much space? I get out of bed and I think, oh, look, I just sleep on the one, I always sleep on one side. My husband's like that, I get out of bed and it's a perfect little triangle <laughs> I've slept in. I don't sleep in the whole bed. And so you have to think of a scanner. Well, I can lie in my bed and not move. So why don't I say this scanner? I'm just in my bed and I'm super chilled. And actually when my client couldn't get in the scanner, I was in a scanner and I thought, I'm going to play a game with myself. I'm going to say... I'm in my bed, I'm so chilled, I've got all this time to just lie here. And then I started to go, oh, I'm in a coffin. And I noticed straight away, they were saying to me, you're, you're moving in the scanner. I didn't know I was. When I said, this is a coffin, I'm trapped, I'm in a cave, I don't like it. My body was trying to get, get out. So we have to learn to dialogue with ourselves. I'm safe, this is great, I'm on a plane, it's safer than being in a car. So Marissa, it sounds like you're talking about becoming the tamer of the horse, becoming the professional driver of yeah. a Ferrari. And one of the ways you do this, you go, I can do this. I've got this. I can do it. I can do it. And so really what you're doing is you're learning how to dialogue with yourself. You know, all sorts, if you want a great business, learn how to dialogue with your customers. Want a great marriage? Learn how to dialogue with your spouse or your children. But actually the most important dialogue is how do you talk to yourself? Mm. That is everything, learning to dialogue with you. So if you were driving a Ferrari and you went, oh my God, I can't handle this machine. I don't even know how to control it. I'm going to crash. So I'm saying, I've got this. I just put my foot there and I look at that gauge and I do that. And after when you're driving a car or riding a horse, you are saying, I've got this. I'm doing this. I remember years ago, my daughter was riding. I said, darling, always look at the horse's ears. When the horse is upset, the ears go back. And she was watching. When they went back, she, she pushed them forwards again. <laughs> so I remember her thinking, well, that's what you do. You keep the ears in the happy state, not in the upset state. But um, we've got to do that with ourselves. It's really noticing how do you dialogue? Do you say things like, I'm losing it, I'm dying, I can't do this? Because we know that we say, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. 
that we function so much better than I yeah. haven't got it. So it is about learning how to control the Ferrari, the horse, which is your mind, and how you control it is because if you understand the way you feel about everything, and I do mean everything is down to just two things, pictures you make in your head and the words you construct. And you could even say it's just the words. Huh. So, you know, if I was going to have blood taken and I went, oh, my God, I'm going to put a needle and it's going to hurt. But if I was going to have a tattoo, I wouldn't say that. Yeah. If I was going to have Botox. And if I was in tremendous pain, I'd be saying, where's the needle? When I got run over last year, I was in the middle of the street and I was waiting for the ambulance. I thought, when I hear that siren, I'll know that I'm going to be out of pain because it was very painful. I mean, I was breathing, I was coping. But when they turned up, I was like, oh. Here's my arm, and I knew they they gave me a mask, and then and I wasn't in any pain anymore. They set my leg, and off I went to hospital. I was so excited about the ambulance siren. I was desperate for that needle to go in my arm, even if I was needle phobic, because I had thought a different thought. <laughs> now, if I if I if there was a lump of meat right here on the table now, if I'm a Hindu, that's offensive. If I'm a vegan, it's disgusting. If I'm a bodybuilder into keto or paleo, it's amazing. If I'm really hungry, it's fantastic. So it's never the thing, it's what you think about the thing. Mm -hmm. And what you think about the thing is you can change it, upgrade it at any time. So we've got to forget about the thing and it's the thoughts we think about the thing that can hurt us, hold us back, disable us. And yet we can change our thoughts about the thing at any time. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. My workload can be pretty substantial and I'm often switching from one task to the next or getting on a plane, getting off one, hotels, packing, moving, all ways going. Not only when I get home, but also during the holidays, I really prioritize focusing on my family. I take time off, I turn off my devices, I delete apps from my phone that I know consume a lot of energy. It's really because the gift of presence over giving presence really goes a long way. And even though being with family and around my family is the biggest part of the holidays for me, I also know that I need to prioritize myself. I know that I need to regulate my nervous system as I come down from a really busy season of work and then into my home. And for those of you who might be visiting family, being able to regulate yourself as you're around the unpredictability that the holidays can bring. A great way to not only learn how to regulate your nervous system, but to actually get you into regulation is to do a therapy session. Getting support by talking to a therapist has always been super helpful for me, especially in helping me reflect on circumstances and situations in my life, being able to navigate things from a more calm and present place so that when I'm with my family, I'm with my family. Therapy has always been a gift for myself because it helps me be better. It helps me grow and change. Now, if therapy sounds like something you could use to help you regulate and calm as well, give BetterHelp a try. It's really easy to sign up online because you can make it fit in with your schedule. Just fill out a fast questionnaire to be matched with a licensed therapist. In this season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com groves to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash groves. I know in your book, you dive into this in much greater mm. detail. For the people listening, what is the process of telling yourself a better lie? The process is, first of all, take a look at how you talk to yourself about yourself. Do you use words like, this is killing me, this is terrifying, this is, um, this is too much, I'm stressed out of my mind, I'm having a really bad, everything's going wrong. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's like, is that really true? Is mm -hmm. everything going wrong? Is it always like this? You don't even need to do that, but you can just say, is this really true? And even if it is true, could I make it easier on myself? You know, I remember my friend who had IVF and had a baby. And she said, I'm insane with titles. Of, Come on, if that's not true. This is a baby you wanted your whole life. You're not insane. Mm -hmm. You're tired. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow you won't be tired. And in 15, you won't even know where your kid is. Then you'll be insane <laughs> with stress because he's not keeping you up all night. You know, you have to get everything into perspective, especially your language. And I do something called PPP, which means look at your problem. Is it personal? Is it all pervasive and is it permanent? So, you know, your kid is in your bed at four years old. Well, that's not permanent. Another 16 years of being in someone else's bed and you'll probably never see them. And you'll wish they were still in your bed and in, under your care because that doesn't last. It's not permanent. It's not personal. They just want to be with you. And it's not even all pervasive. They're at school, they're in daycare, you're having dinner, you're making love with your partner. So unless it is all the three Ps all the time, it actually really can't hurt you. 
And so you have to get some perspective, you know. My kids are so messy every time I come in. There's sofa cushions on the floor and there's a peanut butter smear on the fridge. And this is driving me crazy. You know, when you're an old lady, you'll long for those days yeah. when someone put peanut butter on the telephone <laughs> and there were cushions all over the floor and they were using your sofa as a trampoline. And then you have to think, I think the thing, best thing is to say, is this someone else's fantasy dream? Would someone say, wow, your kid's making a mess? I haven't got kids. I never had a kid. That's my fantasy dream. Your husband leaves his pants on the floor. That's my fantasy dream come true. Mm. So whatever your problem is, I was talking to a girl recently who's just written a book and was saying, oh my God, it's so stressful. You know, I've got to go into the recording studio. I'm going on a show. I said, but that's your fantasy. Mm -hmm. Someone else said, what are you complaining about? You're going on television to talk about your book? That's a fantasy dream come true. And the second thing is, what I've given for this problem 15 years ago, 10 yeah. years ago, the, the mortgage rates have gone up. It's always something going wrong. You know, I live on Venice canals, and I know this, this guy goes, he said, look, when you live on water, things go wrong every year. The bird alarm stops working. Everything's because of the water. I thought, yeah, but, you know, I live on this canal. This, if you live on the beach, it's even worse. But is that really a problem? Yeah. You don't have to live on the beach. Is this someone else's fantasy dream come true and... What would I have given for this from before I had it? When we change our thoughts like this, when we change the way we talk yeah. to ourselves, the words we use, how does that impact us physiologically? Well, you know, in the rule of control, thoughts come. But we think feelings come first. They don't. Apart from two things, the loud noises and the fear of falling back, which thoughts come in front of feelings. You see, you can't feel scared of a bee or a spider unless you have a thought, which is, oh, I'm terrible. You could think, oh, I find spiders fascinating. I love looking at bees. The world wouldn't survive without bees. So it's like a ladder. First, you have a thought. And imagine if you thought, I'm not enough every day. Just imagine you think that thought, mm -hmm. or I'm a loser every day. Every feeling you feel is bad. You're going to feel sad, defeated, maybe angry, maybe resentful. But there isn't a feeling you're going to feel that is good. So you have a negative thought. And then all the feelings have to be negative too. I'm inadequate. I can't do it. I'm helpless. I'm so frustrated. I'm annoyed that other people do do it. I can't. And then you have a behavior that follows the feeling because it's thought feeling. And the behavior is often no behavior. I'm not going to ask anyone out or I've ordered my house or go for that promotion because then you have a loop, the thought. So I'm inadequate. I feel terrible. I don't do much because I'm inadequate. Mm -hmm. So it's a loop. And it loops. But you have to just do it differently. I'm really gifted. I've got some really great talents here. Now I feel positive. I feel confident. I feel reassured. I feel brave. And the behaviors, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for a promotion. I'm going to go for that job. I'm going to ask that person now. I'm going to start my own business because I have a talent. Mm -hmm. So it's always a loop. You think of a thought. That thought completely dictates your feelings. The feelings dictate your behaviors and actions. And then you have something called, a, it's, confirmation bias where you've made all that thought real so you, so you make your beliefs and then your beliefs turn around and make you and then you look for proof of what you have to and you know what when you look for proof of what you believe you're always going to find it you know you can believe people are mean people are great life is hard life is amazing dogs are vicious dogs are man's best friend whatever you believe you'll find it so if you make your beliefs and your beliefs make you, and then you find confirmation by what you have chosen to believe. You might as well go back and say, well, why don't I think a better belief? Right. I don't have friends. Everyone likes me. I haven't, I've got a terrible memory. I've got a great memory. I'm not good at anything. Actually, I'm gifted at something. Anybody, I need to be good at one thing anyway, and I'm really good at this one thing. So it's really understanding that responsibility means an ability to respond. We're all response-able for managing our own emotions. We're all response-able upgrading our thoughts. We're so busy upgrading our laptops and our computers <laughs> and we forget, hang on a minute, shouldn't I upgrade what's in here? Shouldn't I upgrade this? Yeah. It doesn't matter if you've got a 10-year-old phone, it really matters if you've got 20-year-old thinking. Uh, it doesn't matter if your iPad's eight years old, but it really matters if your thoughts uh, are still those of an eight-year-old. It sounds like that's neuroplasticity in action. It is. You know, people are very interested, I need to control my weight, I need to control my kids, I need to control the mess in my house, I need to control the traffic, I need to control my body so I can't get sick. There's only one control. The law of control says control begins and ends with your thoughts. You mm. can't control the traffic. You might notice I've got a little throaty thing because I was stuck at an airport for 18 hours on Saturday. 
And I, I should have actually done what I do is shove some cream up my nose and put a mask on, and then I'm controlling possibly less I to get a virus. In life, it's only one thing you can control, and that is your thoughts. And when you control your thoughts, it changes your life. When you make them positive, it makes your life extraordinary. So what life looks like when you understand, okay, the law of control begins and ends with this. The only thing I can control are my thoughts in 9-11, in COVID, in all the things, SARS, AIDS, all the things that we've been going through. Life always goes back eventually to being normal. And all the things we fear, very they often don't even happen. And so it's like, you know, in, in COVID, I could say I, I'm trapped. Or I could say I'm safe at home. Yeah. I'm trapped. Or, hey, I'm in my house. I've always wandered now to myself. I'm, this is great. I'm not on the tube. Everyone else is in the same position. In 9-11, I mean, that was a terrible thing. But, you know, life goes back. When we go through this process of making the subconscious conscious and really bring forward these thoughts that are really living in the mm. abyss of our mind. And now we've brought them forward so we can pay attention to where the unconscious subconscious is operating. When we're operating from that space, the driver of the Ferrari, what does that look like in our lives and what's possible for us? Do you know, it looks like peace. You know, you don't have this way you get with, oh, I've got to go on the freeway. Oh, look, I've gained weight. Oh, look, everything doesn't right. Look, I haven't got any nice things for breakfast. I'm such an idiot. It looks like you wake up and go, I love my life. Oh, I love the smell of this coffee. I love the smell of this shower gel. I love hearing my kids laughing. You very much live in the moment and you learn to be super grateful for pretty much everything. Probably sounds a bit sickening, but it's actually really <laughs> lovely to wake up and think, wow, I love my life. I love my sheeps. I love going downstairs and having a cup of tea. I love seeing my little puppy down there. And you start to just live in the moment because the, the future's promise and the moment is all you have. But you also... Use this very good word choice so you can say, I'm choosing to not put sugar in my coffee and I'm choosing to love it. I'm choosing to do the playing for 10 minutes before I go to it, choosing to love it. I'm choosing to listen to my kids in the back and choosing to love that too. Because those words changed my life. I'm choosing to say no to dessert and yes to berries. I'm choosing to love it. I'm choosing. When I go to the gym, I say, mm, no, I hate it. I go to my body, my stomach loves crunches. My body loves the plank. I do not love the plank, but my body loves it, loves it. See, you really, you are now running the show. Instead of some random stuff in your past, you understand that you are running the show and you get to say, I have chosen to be a speaker. So I'm going to choose to be comfortable. I've chosen to spend all weekend working on my website. I'm going to choose to love it. I've chosen to be a runner. So I'm going to run and go, wow, do I love running? Because when you have a brilliant mind, which we all have, you have another choice. Talk yourself into it or talk yourself out of it. I mean, so many of us talk ourselves out of it. I could do that, but it might go wrong. I could write that book. What if it's terrible? I could have my own What if nobody comes? And so you learn when you're, you've got this inaction to use that word choice a lot. Hey, I chose to be a parent. And doesn't it come with a territory? Your kids keep you up at night, break stuff. I chose to have a dog. Of course, they throw up on the carpet. I chose to have a cat. Yes, they get fur everywhere. Next time I'll get a short-haired one. But you learn the word choice. If I chose this, then I can choose to enjoy every minute of it. If I choose to do this and then say, I'm choosing this and choosing to feel great about it. So if I say, I'm choosing to have berries instead of dessert, my mind goes, oh, you made that choice. And if I say, oh, I want the dessert. Why can't I have the dessert? Other people are having dessert. Why shouldn't I have dessert? I've now created tremendous resistance. I want the dessert, but I'm not going to have it. And I'm going to wish I had. I'm going to have it and then feel so bad because I shouldn't have eaten it. So just that word, I'm choosing this. And you feel great about it. You know, it's a bit like when I took my daughter to the airport on Monday and I felt very sad that she left. And I thought, but that's because I love her so much. So that's a good feeling. If mm -hmm. I didn't care and I wasn't feeling tearful, then surely that's a sign of how much we love each other. And she was the same. So even when you feel sad, you can go, but yeah, but I'm choosing this. I chose to build a great relationship, of course. Yes. I feel bereft when people leave. I chose to love my husband. So if he's away for a week, I'm going to miss him. But isn't that a good choice? Yeah. Some people choose to be all alone because they never want to feel it. They go, no, I'm choosing aloneness. I'm not going to have anyone in my life and then I'll never be disappointed, never be let down, never be sad, never be vulnerable. But that's actually a really bad choice to make. So... If you always bring it back to, didn't I choose this? Didn't I choose to have four kids? Didn't I choose to have animals? Didn't I choose to have a mortgage? Didn't I choose to buy this? Didn't I choose to have my own business? 
with that comes stuff that goes wrong. But as long as you can say, but I chose it. I'm choosing to love it. I'm choosing to feel great about it. I'm choosing it. All resistance disappears from your life, which is so nice. When we're operating from that level of choice and yeah. presence, what is possible for our lives, our relationships, our friendships, our work, everything? You know, what works for me and all my clients is to say this, I'm a flawed person. Having a flawed relationship with a flawed person, I call it being flawsome. Being flawsome <laughs> means you're flawed, That's I'm good. flawed. Let's have a beautiful flawed relationship. If I say, hey, I'm perfect, you better be perfect too. Now we can have a perfect relationship. We're setting ourselves for massive disappointment. Mm -hmm. So the basis of all friendship is we choose people to share our vulnerabilities. That's what we build a friendship. Even in a marriage, it's like, I love your vulnerabilities. I love the fact that you get a bit cranky. I love the fact that, you know, when you're hungry, you're hangry. I, I know you. I know that you get super defensive when this happens. And I'm okay with that. In fact, you know, like my husband can't find anything. And he has that look, I call it a startled pony look. And I, I love that because I can find everything and we work very well together. And he said, you're the only person who never gets cross when I lose things. But why would I be cross? I knew what he was like. And then I met him, it, it, you know, it's not like, oh, now you've got to be a person who remembers. I remember stuff. I always carry both our passports and it's all fine except when I'm not with him. But that, that ability to say, okay, if I want a perfect relationship, I've entered a race with no finish. As I get to perfection, it moves and it moves and it moves. And people who try to be perfect in a relationship are the unhappiest people. They're also the loneliest because often they don't even have a relationship because they expect so much. And if you expect perfection, disappointment comes. If you expect flawsomeness, flawsome. my friend's got a flaw. They're always late. My friend forgets birthdays. My friend is a bit messy. And I'm not, but that's a lovely thing. And so it's the ability to say, I'm flawed and I'm okay with that. And you're flawed too. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be, you just turn up and be yourself because that's really all you ever can be. We all have flaws, but we forget that sometimes they, they make us very endearing. It's like when you get a puppy with a lopsided grin or you're, I mean, I used to love my baby's triple knees that, you know, mm -hmm. their little gummy smile, um, they, they don't have any hair. They try to say something. They say, you stood it on me or you trod it on me. My little girl said to me, mommy, that toilet just bitted me because the seat came down when she was sitting on it. I thought that was so funny. That toilet seat just bitted me. But we love this. This is the, this is the endearing stuff. And yet we're all so busy trying to be perfect, which just doesn't exist. The unhappiest people try to be perfect. The happiest people say, let's all be flawed together. There's a deep level of exhale that yeah. comes with living with that. And mind. acceptance, you know, the worst thing you can do is to have a kid and say, you've got to be perfect now. Or I find a partner and I'm going to make this person perfect. Because if that, that means you're rejecting someone. That's not unconditional love. And, and in a relationship, we, we all have this strange thing that love should be bought, earned, chased, worked for. And that's not love. Love should just be given freely. You, no one said you've got to earn it. You know, you wouldn't say to your baby, hey, you got to earn my love. You just give it to them. Mm -hmm. They give it straight back to you. And then we forget about that. And we think we've got to be worthy of love. And we have this weird belief. I'll be happy when I'm loved. I'll be happy when I'm perfect. But actually, the truth is, you can be happy right now. Mm -hmm. Happiness is an inside job. If you think you've got to be perfect to be happy, you'll never be happy. But if you're happy, that's a much easier thing. So take away the, I'll be happy when or if, and say, I'm happy right now, and then it's just easier. Marissa, I have so loved this conversation, and it has brought to the forefront the level of responsibility that we have to have for our minds. Oh, yeah, huge. Yeah, and I've, I, I got to say, like, sometimes I get a bit lazy about the mm -hmm. thoughts and then the old ways of being. It, it is such a mm -hmm. habitual thing that you have yeah. to wake up in the morning and this be part of your process. Yeah. So what, what the way you go around that is to have a little ringtone on your phone. Maybe this girl is on fire. I'm having the time of my life. Or <laughs> it's a new day. It's a new day and I'm feeling good. Because a ringtone reminds you, oh, I've, didn't I choose to say that? It's mm. a new day. I'm feeling good. I'm having the time of my life. It's a beautiful world. I mean, so if you have a ringtone, it reminds you. And then, you know, people call them affirmations. I prefer to call them statements. Which is put something on your fridge on your screensaver, on your wallpaper that says, 
I love my life. Maybe have something like I'm enough. And that is your password. Of course, you don't have squiggles and dots and numbers. It's got to be safe. If you have to open your phone, open it would be by typing in I'm enough or I love myself or I'm a, I'm a happy person. It's a very good way to keep it going. So make sure your passwords become a great message to yourself. Change them a lot. Change the way you <laughs> write them. We don't always have, want to have the same passwords. But um, one of my clients said, my password, like, after you, I changed my life, I forgive my wife. He said, I wrote that. And every time I had to write it to open my computer. Mm. And from hating her, I began to, he said, I totally changed. I thought, yeah, I do forgive her. She's a flawed person. She didn't know what she was doing. And anyway, even if she wasn't, I got to forgive her, not for her, but for me. So I love that, that he read my book and wrote that as his password. And it changed his life. And he found a new wife very quickly because he let go. In, mm. in forgiving, you let go. You know, the opposite of letting go is to hold on to resentment and anger and bitterness. Let it all go. And then you'll find somebody better. Thank you so much for making and taking the time to share your brilliance, your experience, your knowledge, everything with being able to remind us and teach us how to move from operating very unconsciously to actually being this responsible with yeah. our choices, our life, our thoughts, and how that can have such a transcendent effect on everything. everything. Sure. So thank you so You're much welcome. for being here. You're welcome. Um, for the people listening, where can they find more of you? Where can they get your book? Well, I'm so glad my name is Marissa Peer, not Sue Smith. Nothing wrong with that name because <laughs> you can find my books everywhere. You can find my stuff all over YouTube and Instagram. Marissa, just go to Marissa Peer. My books are in many bookshops and all over Amazon. And if you go to marissapeer.com, we get a lot of free stuff. We have audios on money blocks, health blocks, love blocks, they're all totally free. We don't ask for your credit card. And if you want to train in our TT and do, we train, I've trained 16,000 people to do exactly what I do. Many of them here in LA, a lot of them here in LA. If you go to rtt.com, you can find out how to train with us or find someone that does what I do that will help you quickly and powerfully. Beautiful. Well, we'll make sure we put all that in Thank the show you. notes. Thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.